Okay. So, hey everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, I'll start now. Um, I want to give a talk about motion design and user interfaces and give a short introduction to this topic. And actually, I want to tell you why motion design is more than just a small gimmick, as many people think, or which is possible to think about, um, and how it can boost your and your client's business. Um, but first, I want to briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Lukas Jardin. I'm a graphic designer at Joomla GmbH here in Cologne, so it's my hometown. I'm quite happy that you're all here. Uh, it's nice. Um, and actually, I'm a student uh, in integrated design also in Cologne. It's a real diverse design studio, so it's, it's quite nice. Um, and yeah, I want to talk with you about things like that, like this small animation and interface. I know, I don't know if you know it. It's really nice. It's a login screen. So you go to the password. <laughs> it's hiding. And as you see, you're laughing. So that's what motion design can bring. So, so how motion design can bring values to interfaces. Um, on the one hand, oops, it can improve the usability of interfaces. And on the other hand, as you see, it just can make fun and yeah, people love, you can deliver emotions. It's something you, you can recognize and you will tell about people. So it's, it can be an experience worth sharing somehow if interfaces are really like fluent and it just feels nice to use them and when, if there's something funny in there or personal. So yeah, there's a famous quote from Charles Eames. I don't know if you know them. It's a famous product designer from the US. Uh, who said the details are not the details, they make the design. And I think, especially in web design, it's really a fact because, I don't know, you have like these two basic layouts where you have like left image, right text, right image, left text. And if you bring value to, to small details and make them look beautiful, perfect, or it just really feels good, it's different to, to like a standard layout somehow. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you know this model from Moriaki Kano, who said like there's an, a pyramid of needs humans have, where it starts with real human needs, like you need food, you want to have a shower, and it ends with self-fulfillment. You want to do something which makes you happy and which delivers some value to, to your friends and to like public. And I think there's the same with websites. So at the real basics, the website has to be functional so it has to it, it has to work somehow that's all then a website has to be reliable so that we trust so the, the content has to be true we know that it's yeah that we can trust the, the content we see in there and then things start to get usable so that it's easy to use but it's well, this one really doesn't say a quality about use usage but this one it, it becomes easy to use and then it comes convenient but it's really nice to use we start really liking it and it's a pleasure using it. And the two things at the top, uh, meaningful and pleasurable, pleasurable uh, that will start getting fun. So where we have like a personal binding to this stuff where we feel like, like you, you did, you, you laughed. So it's like you bring emotions. That's what's where, where things are starting to, to make fun. And that's what we as web designers or service providers as I don't know, consultants, what we want to achieve. We want our clients to help them produce things like that, or yeah, or we need to produce it for them. So we want to create awesome stuff. I think that that's why we do this job somehow. Um, that's what makes me at least happy, besides the money, but also I want to deliver joy. Um, and I also think that it's a great chance of free marketing. So. If you see something beautiful and you want to share it so people get to know each other, uh, know this stuff too. And somebody said once that it doesn't matter that you have a great product if nobody knows about it. Um, so you need to share it somehow with the world. And I think that people who are satisfied with the product will tell other people and it will go on. And yeah, I think that this, this personal recommendation is real strong so it's better than just a Facebook ad or something so it's it's better and it's a chance of free marketing so why shouldn't we use it and the other problem is that these free parts can all be done with Wix.com or Foursquare I don't know with uh, Squarespace so we need to create products better than that otherwise we won't survive in the future so and I think they make their job quite good so there's, there's no problem about Wix so it's yeah, we have to, to face this challenge and we have to do the best out of it. 
<laughs> and yeah, there's another model where it's about uh, customer satisfaction, which you can see in the middle. So here, these are things with low satisfaction and in the uh, top it's high satisfaction. And here you can see if uh, things are implemented on, uh, or not. So there are like these basic needs which are expected and unspoken. So an example would be if you buy a telephone, you, yeah, you expect that you can make a call with it. It's not something special, it's a basic need about it. Um, and on the other hand, you have the lighters, which are unexpected and unspoken. And if they're added to a product, they bring value. Um, so that's what makes things special somehow. I don't know if the first phones with a camera, it was quite special. It was something why people buy this phone. It wasn't about the, that they can make a call. So that's not why they buy this phone. And that by the time things who, are, who were special or are special, will become a basic need. It's the same with a camera. Nobody would buy a phone without a camera at the moment. Or to stay in the web context, it's the same uh, with responsive web design. A few years ago, a responsive website was something special that you liked it, but now nobody would create a website which isn't responsive. So there's absolutely no value in this. Um, and yeah, that's why I said in the beginning that animations are still a chance to, to stand out of the the amount of other websites or the concurrence. Um, but I think that it surely become a need someday, especially because if you look in apps and your smartphone, most of the things are moving and having this fluent layouts and user interfaces. Uh, and it's becoming more and more with websites too. So people will get used to it and are unsatisfied if you can't deliver some, uh, something like that. But I think it's slightly different with animations because it's more like that. I changed not implemented with badly implemented. And then you see if you use animations and user interfaces in a wrong way, they also can really break down the usability and make things hard to use, difficult to use. And by this, people won't like you, uh, don't like your interface. So the question is how can motion design increase the usability of product? So at first it can fulfill user expectations uh, we will come to that later. I will show you like 12 basic techniques you can use in user interfaces and motion design. Um, it provides continuity, uh, con continuity in use, at least it can. So if animations always stay the same or like this, uh, yeah, transitions from one side to another. So if you switch context somehow, but you see how the context change it and every, it's every time the same way, it's much easier for the user to understand what's happening on this page. Because the problem is in on screens, you have like only two dimensions. And in our all, everyday life, we're orientating us in 3D room. So we're used to it. It's somehow unnatural to navigate through, uh, through two dimensional spaces for us. So animations are a chance here. Um, they can tell stories and they even can provide identity. So if you like, uh, you have a corporate des uh, design, which also can include and incorporate motion design somehow. And if you implement that to your user interfaces, people will recognize it and they just need to see, oh, I know this transition, it's this and this brand. So it really can deliver value. Um, it can show relationships between different elements on the screen. And you have like, I don't know, 10 elements on the screen and they move in relationship to each other. You surely can see that, understand it, and therefore also understand the the interface much better. Um, and what's really important is also can simulate performance. If you have performance issues with your page, you can use these fluent transitions to, yeah, somehow fake the performance. And if you look back at the table, we see that performance is also a thing which truly increase uh, the satisfaction of our user if it's a page is real fast. And yeah, like I already said, back then there was more 3D. It's the, the last really important thing why animations can be useful in user interfaces. Um, so yeah, during the last years we saw this material design, flat design stuff. So buttons aren't really looking like buttons anymore. We had it before with drop shadows and it was really easy to understand that this was a button because it, these drop shadows, they're like, I don't know if you know the term skymorph. So it was, we looked at our, at the real world and just uh, simulated the stuff and the appearance, but we're go, going back, well, going back, going away from this. So therefore we can use animations to 
yeah, help users understand things. So if you have questions, just use, uh, use Slide.io. We'll come back to this. But after the why, as I said, I want to tell you also how you can use it. I want to tell you like 12 basic techniques with examples where you can see how it works. I um, want to tell you about common mess, uh, mistakes you have to avoid. And we'll talk about briefly about tools for prototyping and implementation because I think they doesn't really matter. So the 12 basic techniques are easing, offset and delay, parenting, transfer, you can, you can read, I guess it's easier. So, and yeah, now we go quickly through all of these and I show you, yeah, how it's working. So first thing is the easing. So I don't know if you can see it, but if you briefly look, they behave slightly different. So the left one is like a linear animation. It's always the same speed where the, with how the ball is moving. Um, and on the right hand side, it starts slower, becomes faster and gets slower again. So that's like smoother. Um, and easing is really like the foundation of animation uh, because it's more natural than linear animations. It's same in, in uh, yeah, like in nature. Um, and therefore it's less distracting for people. So every time we use animations in user interface, we have to think about if they aren't like too much so that people only look at the animation and won't look at the uh, at content. So these are like, it's a, it's a good starting point to, yeah, to start with animations and user interfaces. Um, and it's the basic, so it's also used in all the other techniques which I will show you now. So the second one is offset and delay. You can see there, so that's how it's called. And you see that these small icons, they appear slightly after each other. So there's like a small delay between each. Um, and there you can also see how this technique works. So we animate things with a small delay to show that they're not directly connected. You can see all of them have to do something with this uh, calendar appearance, but all of them are own functions, so that's why they appear slightly after each other. And yeah, that's like the the basic function of this animate type of animation um, to see if elements are connected or separated with each other. Um, the other part is parenting. I guess it's quite common in drag and drop interfaces. It just says that one thing is moving or doing something because another thing is doing something. Um, and yeah, I think at least here it's, it would be much tougher to understand what's happening in this uh, drag and drop interface if you just drag it, drop it, but the, the bars between won't slowly go down, but they just, poof, there's a new one and you don't understand the order, what's happening. So this one is much easier to understand. So it shows relation and gives orientation to the user. Um, yeah, so the next one is one of my favorite animations. It's a it's submit button. I really like it. Um, and yeah, it's not too complex, but uh, it shows the, the status change of the button. First it's submit, you click on it, you know what's happening and then it's, uh, it's accepted. So on the one hand side, you always know what's happening. Uh, it's an immediate feedback, so it's really important for the user because yeah, research shows that if people have to wait more than a second, yeah, they don't really like it. So they, they become leaving the site or there's a higher bounce rate about it. Um, yeah, and what's also nice to see, the animation itself isn't that big, so it's not a powerful big animation. A lot of things happening that are quite small. Uh, and what's nice is that humans are trimmed to movement. So the animations we use in interfaces don't have to be that big because yeah, if there's a tiger around the edge, we have to see it. So kind of uh, the evolution, our yeah, visual recognition is trimmed to, to uh, movement. And yeah, if you have questions, yeah. Um, the next one is a quite common technique. It's just a change of uh, text-based values. So if you use the slider, the text will change. It's nothing really fancy, um, but it's nicer that it's, it's going like that. And then you have like this uh, zero, 30, 50, so that you can see it's much more precise in a way. So it's easier for people to find exactly the, 
the amount of yeah, value in, in some its uh, persons uh, they want to find and use. Um, and yeah, this technique is like every time connected to user inputs or sometimes you see this, uh, I don't know, 500 cups of coffee uh, drank during the last year in our agency or somehow. Um, yeah, it's, it tells really the story of the number behind and you understand what's happening and it's quite good and it's really simple to, to implement it. Um, the next one, Amarsk, so you can see it here. And here it's like a real fluent page transition, so it feels nice, you know what's happening. And what's also important that you can show like, yeah, what's important in this page. At the moment you see, yeah, it's like this one is, if you, you, you know it from, from nature somehow, if it's turning in the CD player, you know it's playing. And then it goes up and you know, oh, something else happened. I'm at the, the album cover. So it's easier for people to recognize. And I think it's just fluent and nice to, to it's more, much more cooler or nicer or more beautiful than if you switch just the page. So it's, yeah, it's also about fun somehow. Um, the next technique is overlays. You know it from Google Mail or Apple Mail, so you, where functions, hiding under uh, under another element. So you know, if you put it by side, that means give help, and I think the other one is interested, is connected to this mail or this activity at this time. So there's no need for more explanation somehow. Um, and it's really clear and easy. And you have the, uh, the chance to put more information, which are at the first time important on one page. So the, the interface becomes more clean somehow because you don't need to place this give help and interested button on the page itself. It's only you deliver context uh, functions in context, which is much more nicer. So because it's easier to understand. Um, on the other side, you also create room. As I said, we need this spatial orientation somehow. And you know it's hiding under, so it's clear it belongs to another. Um, yeah. Another technique I really like is cloning, and I think this one is really nice. So, props to Jakob. Um, yeah, there you also show that elements on the page are connected to each other and have like the same origin somehow. Um, so that, for example, here these interactions merge out of it. Um, what's really important is that if you imagine you click here and all the other functions appear. Um, you're already looking like on the right place on the page, so you see these functions quite fast and recognize what's happening. Um, again, you can yeah, hide functions somehow and concentrate on, or focus on the most important things so that the user interface becomes cleaner again, which is quite important. And yeah, what's really nice to hear, it's a quite complex function or a task what's going on there, but it really feels like one, you, you want to wait, it's fine because the animation is beautiful, it's better if there, it's better than that there only stands, yeah, wait, you're searching or something. And it's also, it, it feels shorter, so we also fake performance somehow. Um, and yeah, so that that's, that's nice, I like it. Um, the last one, you know it, everyone who has an, has an iPhone knows it, it's the blur. Um, it's the same again. There are functions hiding other uh, objects hiding in another object. So you can show like visual hierarchies, really good. You know what's happening. Uh, you know oh, also the, the, the parts which are blurred aren't important at all. I don't have to look at it. Um, so you can really focus on certain elements and make interfaces more clean, which is, yeah, most of the techniques are about orientation and making interfaces slim and clean. Um, the next one is the parallax effect, which also, yeah, yeah, evolves kind of, of uh, tries to imitate natural behavior. So things which are in the back are moving slower than things in the front, and therefore you easy. So that's what you're feeling. So you're feeling that this one is closer to you than the the image in the, at the back. Um, so you also have this, this spatial orientation from nature, which is quite nice, easy to understand. You don't have to learn about it. Um, and you recently get that the things in the front are more important than the, the image in the back. So that's, that's nice and it's, yeah, it's, it looks good. 
Um, and yeah, that's what the technique is mostly all about. You see this parallax effect often as a decorational element, which is also quite fine. But I just want to show that you can also use it to provide information and yeah, give give value to in, in usability. So then there's this three dimensionality. There are three different types as you look closely. They also uh, imitate nature somehow, so they give this spatial orientation and create a, a room space where people can navigate. And it's yeah, also you don't have to learn it somehow. It's quite easy to understand that people will will know how to use it quite fast. Um, what's also quite good is that you have simply more space where you can place elements. So if you on the left side you fold this tab bar down, um, so you have like I don't know fifty pixels more where you can place information or where you can which you can use to bring more padding between elements to make it cleaner, easier to navigate. People with big fingers don't have problems to touch small things. Um, and yeah, the last one, is what time it's really the last one, uh, it comes out from the uh, film industry, it's like it's a dolly and zoom called. So you move towards or away from an element, you see it here quite good. Um, and it's nice to give, uh, to use in context internal changes, so here you're in this gallery uh, view. And you just go into detail and use this, uh, do this by a zoom. So it's a, yeah, a smooth transition between the, the contexts and you, at every time you know what's happening. So that's quite nice for the user to understand. Um, and yeah, these are like the 12 basic techniques. I know it was quite fast, but there's a beautiful article on Medium. I can show you the link later on, uh, where these, these basic techniques are, yeah, Declared somehow. Um, and now I want to talk about if there's a rule about when to use them because in the beginning I said that if you use animations wrong or you use too much or whatever, um, they also can decrease the usability, not only increase, they, it's time that they're disturbing, they don't make fun, so they're, they're really like yeah, doing the other thing, the thing you, you want. Uh, you don't, don't do not want to achieve, and the problem is that no, there is no rule. Um, yeah, you kind of need to get a feeling for it, and I think it's quite easy to get a feeling for it because if you use it, <coughs> prototype it, and you will see if it's disturbing you or not. Um, and on the other end, you can always ask yourself if this animation fulfill any purpose. Um, does it, yeah, somehow simulate performance? Does it bring orientation to the user? Um, yeah, makes it the interface more clean, like I said. And the last one is, does it make fun? So it depends on the context of the site. Um, if it brings simply bring joy to a user, it's fine. If the, the context is right. I mean, I want they don't have to be too childish somehow, these animations, but they can. So you always have to get a feeling about it. Um, and yeah, I think you have to learn it just in a way. But if you ask your these questions like, does it bring performance orientation, cleaner interface, or is it easier to understand what's happening in context, use them. So, um, but there are also things to avoid, of course, um, which are inconsistent animations. So if one transition is like, uh, you only go to the right side and there's a new screen and then something blurred. So be, consistent in what you're doing. Use the same animations for the same uh, for the whole interface and then things will become more easier to understand. Don't make animations too slow because then it's disturbing. If you have to wait for an off con as many like two seconds, you will you know, no. Simply no. Um, on the other hand, don't make them too fast. If animations are too fast, they're kind of immediate so you don't recognize them and don't understand what's happening at all. So yeah, don't do it, and not too much. Um, if everything is moving and blinking and everything is shiny, you're like, what the fuck, I have no idea what's happening in here. So, yeah, but I think you can also get a feeling for this and you will recognize quite fast if it's too much, if, you, if it's disturbing and you're distracting from the content itself because, yeah, these animations are quite nice, but we shouldn't forget that content is somehow king. If the, the content isn't value, uh, has no value at all, we want 
go on this page anymore. So there's no, no value for us. And avoid these standard easing, like I said in the end, these linear animations. Um, because on the one hand, they look shitty somehow, because it's always like the roboter movement, it's not nice. Um, and it's more distracting than East animations, and if you, uh, use, I don't know, CSS animations or transitions, it's quite, e it's quite easy to just say East and Off, so it's fine. It's just one property more to the, to the CSS. Um, yeah, that's like the theoretical thing about the how-to. And I want to introduce some tools about it, but I think that the tools itself aren't really important because there are too many tools and everybody can use the tool which fits best for him or for her. So just want to give you like After Effects is from Adobe, it's in the suit. Um, for me, it's quite nice to prototype. I will make prototypes with it because yeah, After Effects is like a huge program. You can do nearly everything with it um, and also quite fast. So for me, it's easier than writing these CSS animations and see how it's happening or SVG. Um, then of course you can use InVision or Craftful Sketch, it's the same. Uh, one is the app, one is in Sketch. Or Marvel, which I prefer, uh, so which is my choice if it comes to prototyping somehow. Uh, we did the Joomla 4 backend with Envision, so maybe Lisa can tell more about if it's nice or not. I don't know. Um, for Sketch, there's a real beautiful plugin which is Anima. It's, I guess, 39 dollars. And it's really nice to have this keyframe animation, so it's like After Effects in Sketch, so it's quite nice. and. You can have a look at it, then there's frame my principle and so on and so on. There are like <laughs> tons of tools, um, but I guess that these are the most popular tools somehow. Um, when it comes to implementation, we have of course JavaScript. So it's uh, GSUB, I don't know if you heard about it. It's the Green, green Sock animation plugin. Uh, it's a huge JavaScript library, which is quite easy to learn. So it's not hard. There are like yeah, tutorials with one hour is like a, a brief introduction, an eight hour course where you totally understand the concept behind it and afterwards it's just, yeah, you have to do it. Um, also there's Anime.js and Mojas, which are also real big libraries. And yeah, I, I like them, especially GSUB is really nice. Um, then of course we have SVG animations. I guess I don't have to talk much about it. Uh, you can use CSS, Wicked CSS, Animate CSS, ma uh, Magic. In the end, it's all based on transition, on CSS transition and CSS animations. Um, and we have WebGL, FreeJS. You can write your own shaders if you want to. So that you have like, I can show you an example where the page transition is made out of um, dust somehow, which is quite nice. So it's nice that at the moment we can do like everything. There are no technical restrictions anymore somehow, at least there's no Internet Explorer. Um, <laughs> then it's getting a bit problematic, I guess. Um, but yeah, we have the chance to do it. And one thing about these animations is that it's always the hardest part to create something which is close to nothing. So that you have to do something to make the interface yeah, more fluid, that it feels nice, that people maybe love, uh, yeah, and just like it, tell your friends, oh, look at this, this app looks beautiful. Um, but it shouldn't be too much so that people won't recognize the content anymore, that they feel distracted. So there's a reason why micro-interactions are called micro-interactions. Um, and yeah, that's for me, it's always the hardest part because when I'm into animating stuff, I always, oh, I can do that and I have to say, no, why? There's no reason behind it. Um, and I also want to say that yeah, we talked about this delighter stuff in the beginning where things are getting more beautiful and people will like it, whether people are really satisfied with the product. Animations are just one way to do it, so there are other ways. I think in general we need to bring more yeah, human factors back in web design to make people love. It can also be with, with wording. Yeah, try to deliver emotions and not yeah, be so, I don't know, well, that's a good English word for it, but yeah, be creative, just do it, and yeah, if people say, we have, we have to somehow tell our client what he needs, and not he has to say, ah, oh, but I don't like it because nobody else does like that, yeah, you only stand out if you do something different than the rest, it's not, we have to come to this Einheitsbereich, is it in, in German, I don't know an English word for it, so that everything looks the same. 
And yeah, for me, that's all. I just want to say, Leben Dank. It's also Kölsch. Um, I'm happy that you've been here and I hope that you've learned a bit. If you have any questions, I'm on the boat. I'm here tomorrow, the day after, and I live here, so I'm always here. So come <laughs> around, it's no problem. Um, and yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You use Sketch and Marvel together. Yeah, you can. Or is it just Marvel you use? No, I use. I can show you. Um. Yeah, nine. Skip this version. Um, I don't know if you're somewhere over here. Um, you have a Marvel plugin for Sketch. Yeah. So I say, yeah, that these are my pages with my artboards in there. Then I say Marvel, you and then. Have a screen. Oh shit. Wait, I have to mirror it. It's really uh, the plugin also is very nice because there's like a sync function for the app, for the web app. So uh, no. Mm -hmm. so the app is not only a toy. The app is seriously usable. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it's nice. So. Yeah, you have like an export function from Sketch to Marvel and you can choose the project from which artboards you want to export. And then Marvel is like a visual prototyping tool where you have your screens, can create interactive rectangles, shapes, so where you, people can click and something else will happen. So you go to the next screen or something and you can animate the, the, yeah, the transition somehow, but real basic, but it's for prototyping, it's absolutely perfect and I really like it and can recommend it. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding teaching how to use these interfaces. So if you have something like a submit button, yeah, uh, I can usually say, yeah, that looks great. I think that works. Um, but when you get to the more advanced stuff, when stuff moves around, or for example, I really dislike the overlay example. You said it's very obvious, but I actually don't think it is because you don't know that there's something hiding there. You actually need to know that this interaction is possible. So if I gave this to my grandma, I don't think she would realize that there's this functionality at all. And once she's learned that, she would go to another app, try it, realize it doesn't work, and she'd be really disappointed. So it's not something I would use in a user interface design. How do you teach these new elements when you use them? Um, I think, yeah, if you showed your grandma, of course she, she won't understand. I think it's about the the target group somehow if the target group is really used to such interfaces i guess if you would use the app you would find out quite fast somehow because maybe you know it from mail or something like i said or from other apps so where this technique is quite popular in a way so it depends on the target group and i think then it, it yeah it can be useful but you always like i said have to think about it and for me I, for me i like it but it's yeah, there's it personal somehow and i think you can't make it perfect for everybody somehow, and that's fine. Yeah, I mean, it's like that. But it really depends on the context, um, target group. Also, not only which kind of animation, but also the, the amount of animation. So, um, and in general, the structure of the interface. If you have like a target group which isn't used to, yeah, like this two dimensional orientation on websites, apps, and stuff. Um, I think it's totally fine to, do, to go with a totally skeuomorph look, even if it looks outdated somehow. But it's better if people understand it and afterwards you can, I mean, you can change the styling of the stuff after a while, but first give them the chance to orientate and just do it their things. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, honestly, I think you're kind of dodging the question there, because you, you like, let's say you have a button here on the screen right now, yeah. and you have a mouse cursor. Hmm. I wonder what happens when I go there. Oh, it changes color when I highlight it, or maybe I can click it, and so mm -hmm. on. These things happen, and I could click that, so maybe I can click the other thing I saw as well. So you, you kind of teach the uh, user, but mm -hmm. when you have hidden elements where you need to do some gesture or something, there are crazier gestures as mm -hmm. well, right? Um, you basically need a manual to use yeah, these apps. You can do it with guided tours, for example, mm -hmm. or. Um, You've maybe seen it on a few sites. You have this little scrolling animation, like you have like a big header, yeah, like a hero image or something, and they have this small uh, scrolling image icon at the bottom. And I think that totally also could work with such an app. So the first time you visit this view, you have like a like a small like this 
plus icon on Google Material Design. Oh, this thing which like a tooltip which tells you yeah, go left, go right, so you can see new uh, or more functions. And I think if people you show for the first and second time and afterwards people know how to deal with this stuff. So yeah, you have to train it up somehow. Yeah, that's that part. Is that fine or? Yeah, it's better. So in the app, I would do it with a guided tour. Like. Yeah, I guess. But it, I I wonder like whether there are some whether there's research work, for example, showing um, usability tests and so on, like what people prefer, or whether it's they go to my website and I have such a user interface and. It, what I need to learn how to even use this? Like I'm like I don't want to bother with this. Like I just want the clicky interface. Maybe yeah. that's what. Yeah, I, I think don't know. it also depends on the context how people visit your site, um, because it, for me, I mean, it's a bit special, but I also can make fun to like explore the site. So if they're just searching for quick information on stuff, you can do make make the interface too complex. But if you know I have we are tech agency or something and our customers are also a little bit into tech, yeah you can do it. Mm -hmm. So because you know the user yeah uses the page slightly different than a normal user I would say. In the mail app um, it jumps out a little bit if you visit the site uh, the app uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. Then it jumps a little bit, then you know okay there's something yeah. hidden and then yeah, yeah, stuff like that, like hints. Maybe. Yeah, you, you need to play some these small hints, yeah. Maybe Cliffy. Yeah, it can be. <laughs> Remember that guy? Yeah. Big arrow. <laughs> Thank you. So just go on, enjoy the work. Yeah. Boat tour, <laughs> beer.